Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we're going to talk about preparing a decent looking supplemental information. So when you're making a supporting information or a supplemental information for a paper, one of the things you want to consider is whether or not you have enough detail for your experimental section. So for each compound, you, there might be different preferences from professor to professor uh, in terms of what you should include, but there are things that are better to do and there are things that are worse to do. So different people have subjective preferences about this, and this is something that I think the whole field needs to kind of just decide at some point and then enforce. Now, personally, I lean towards including a lot of information which is more anecdotal, like these are the specific side products that formed, here's a scheme, this is the specific examples used for, the specific conditions used for this example, um, where some people would prefer to minimize that. Some people also prefer the bare minimum, so they want to have as short of an SI as possible, but in my mind, this results in other researchers reinventing the wheel, because now you have to go through and re-figure that stuff all out yourself. And you might think, oh, well, at least I'll save half an hour and I don't have to do it again. It's like, okay, but how many people are going to have to spend half an hour doing that? Because you did it. So I would say you've already had to do this once to purify your compound, right? You had to do a TLC, probably. You had to do a column. Just record it. Write it down. It takes like five seconds. What's, what's the proper excuse? I didn't write it down, so now I have to do it again. It's like, okay, then write it down next time. Don't be dumb. So there's different data requirements depending on what you're doing, but we're going to talk about for an organic paper what you should include. So normally you should include 1H and 13C NMR for all compounds, even if it's been previously reported. Now some journals don't require this. Those journals are wrong. They should, they should require this. Additionally, if you have any fluorine in your molecule, you should do a 19F NMR. The same concept would also apply for like phosphorus. If you have a phosphorus, do a phosphorus NMR. If you have an NMR active nucleus, and it's not some weird obscure one that no one cares about the spectra of, you should get that NMR data. Now, if you have a new compound, you should definitely run HRMS. Now, most journals are pretty anal about this. If you can't get an HRMS, sometimes people will submit elemental analysis. But because you can just choose a really clean part of your compound, or it could easily be thrown off by solvent, elemental analysis can be less than ideal. Another solution to this is to do x-ray crystallography. Now, sometimes people include FTIR data, but in the current age, it's fairly rare that you or I would run FTIR on our sample unless we absolutely needed to for some reason. Now, sometimes journals will require that you include that. Um, I think usually people are pretty lax about that. However, there are certain contexts where you might need that. Like, for instance, if you're specifically looking at the, the IR properties of molecules in your paper, then, of course, you're going to need to have IR data. Now, a thing that we often do in teaching laboratories that you never see in a research context is index of refraction. For whatever reason, this is a thing we just stop doing. Maybe it's because the range of index of refraction is so narrow for organic compounds, but it's just something we don't do anymore. Now, melting point is another one that's kind of sporadic. Sometimes people report it, sometimes they don't. Some journals will say you need to do this for all crystalline compounds. Some will say you need to do it for all compounds. And depending on the solvent that it was crystallized from, it's going to have different melting points usually. So whether or not you have a pure compound crystallized from one solvent or another, it'll have different melting points. So it's a little bit like inconsistent. Now, it can be useful to do this. Um, however, if you get something like an oil, you wouldn't be expected to freeze it just to get a melting point. So it's uh, not always required, but it can be nice to have. So the physical appearance, however, is something you should always have. What does your stuff look like? Is it an oil? Is it viscous? Is it a colloid? Is it amorphous or is it crystalline? Um, what's its appearance, etc. Now, it's also worth noting that if you wanted to do x-ray crystallography, it's really nice because if you can solve the crystal structure, you can definitively prove that you have what you think you have, whereas NMR kind of just infers that. So crystallography is really good. HRMS also can tell you what the mass is, the exact mass is, but it won't necessarily tell you like what the molecule is. It'll just tell you that there's these certain elements based on this exact mass. Now, most of the time we have an idea of what we're, what we're making or what we're isolating, but if you're doing something like natural product isolation or total synthesis, it can be really useful to get x-ray crystal data at some point for your intermediates. Now, in the case of total synth, or in the case of natural product isolation, it's usually helpful to get a single crystal if it's possible. However, the amounts of material that you're trying to isolate might be too small. Now, if you're doing asymmetric synthesis, something like a diastere selective or an enantio selective uh, methodology, it's very common to report EE or DR. So EE is enantiomeric excess. Sometimes if the EEs are low, people will report ERs, which is just the enantiomeric ratio and the diastereomeric ratio, respectively. So sometimes if you're doing chemistry on one center, but there's an adjacent 
um, stereo center, the chemistry can afford mixtures of diastereomers, so it's important to report DRs. Now, these can be determined a few different ways, and if you're curious about that, I can cover that in a future video. Now, if you're doing chiral compounds, historically it was more common, now it's becoming less common. People would expect you to report the specific rotation, or sometimes people call this alpha D. And so, essentially, it's the how much the molecule rotates light as like a solution in a given solvent of known concentration. Now, if you're doing a method paper and it's mostly on racemic substrates, but you have like one or two chiral compounds, people usually don't care if you do it. But if you're doing a ton of methodology on very chiral compounds, it becomes more common to see that sort of thing. But I do believe it's falling out of favor. If you think that this is still definitely required, make sure you comment down below so that I can pin that comment. Now, if you're doing complex synthesis, it can be really useful to do 2D NMR. So sometimes that's HSQC, HMBC, COSY. Sometimes you have to include NOSI data, um, as well as additional NMR experiments, depending on the system that you're dealing with. So for a lot of small molecule chemistry, it's not usually required. But if you're doing like a total synthesis, you're going to be doing a lot of 2D NMR throughout. And a lot of the time, the best way to provide that data is just like uh, as its raw form connected to the file. Uh, connected to the paper because a lot of the time you need to scroll in and out in Mesternova or whatever processing software that you're using and it's easier to see that than to just look at correlations of a snapshot that you took in your SI. So uh, one last thing I want to mention here is that it's really useful to include TLC conditions with RF. So what solvent did you use for TLC for your compound? Um, and so this just is a quick, easy way to confirm whether or not you think you have your compound based on its RF in a given solvent system. It also helps to include stains because not everything is UV active. So here you can see this plate is stained with KMNO4. Now, if you're doing NMR, in older papers, you'll just see peak by peak listed. And so this is just the chemical shift of given peaks with J coupling constants, usually um, relative to something like TMS or a deuterated solvent signal. However, now that we have data storage capacity, we should actually always provide copies of spectra, and the best case scenario is if this is a vector-based spectra. So a vector is uh, like just a spectra you can just keep scrolling into and you can keep seeing more and more detail versus like a static image like a JPEG or a PNG. So uh, some journals are allowing you to submit uh, your original data so that people can reanalyze it and open it on their own computers, then that's actually even better because then there's no chance people are falsifying NMR data. Now, if you're doing an experimental procedure, it's useful to always give the exact conditions for each specific substrate. Sometimes people will say, like, this was just prepared according to this general procedure, but I find that it's better to include the exact conditions in each case. And this might be a temperamental preference thing. But in my opinion, if I'm going to do a reaction with this specific example that you reported, I want to do it exactly the way you did. I don't want to be having to make educated guesses. I want to just do exactly what you did because maybe it's a fine-tuned experiment and that's just not made clear in your paper. So I, I think you should always state the, the specific amounts used in each case. Now, it's also relatively common to see a workup summarized as like it was purified following the standard workup without any reference to what the standard workup is. What was standard 20 years ago might not be as common anymore. In my opinion, the standard workup is you don't do any washes. You just dump it right on a column, do chromatography. However, historically, people would do washes with water and then sometimes base or acid. Sometimes they'd have to quench with something like thiosulfate and then like a salt wash to pull out any water. But that's becoming less and less common as people tend to just do chromatography for almost everything. Now, if you're doing mass spec, EI mass spec can be really useful for determining structure. So it, you can um, point out fragments relative to the M peak, the parent ion, and that can be useful for determining, like, let's say you had a benzene CH2, that's going to give you an, uh, a 91 peak. And so, like, that's a way to say, okay, I had a benzyl group that was cleaved. Now, that can be useful for some molecules, but it's not well suited for everything. ESI can also be useful more often just for, like, the parent ion. Now, if you're looking at more specialized cases, such as like peptides and whatnot, there can be specialized mass spec techniques that are useful for your specific instance. So for polymer, like MALDI would be really useful. Now, if you're reporting a method that was previously reported, in my opinion, you should always write up that experiment. Most of the time, if, if it's not too hard, just do it because it saves new researchers a lot of time when they're going to reproduce your chemistry. Quite often what I experience, and more often than not, I will click on that reference, I will go find that reference, and then that reference won't have the, the prep. And then I have to go to the, another reference, and then it's not in that one, so then I have to go to SciFinder, and then I have to dink around for 45 minutes, just trying to find a procedure. You clearly found it, you reproduced it at one point, just write it up, don't be a nugget, okay? 
So definitely you should reference a previously reported procedure regardless, but at the bare minimum, you could just write up what you did, at least like a summary or at least a scheme. Now, if you're going to say uh, that this was done, just, just like please make sure that your reference is actually linked to a correct prep, not a paper that made it, but didn't report how they made it. Like actually check that they give conditions for how it's made when you reference it. It'll take you like 20 minutes at the most, and that will save people hours and hours of time. So please do that. Now, if you have a general procedure, it's useful to, to list that for a given transformation. So like, let's say you made an amide out of several carboxylic acids. Those can all be grouped into one general procedure. So if you can classify things, that makes it easier for a reader to be like, okay, this is one of the main reactions they did. I can follow this relatively easily. Um, it's also useful if you want to adapt a methodology to a new substrate, whereas your specific case by case substrates might have slight variances from the general procedure. If you have done a lot of these reactions, you'll have a good sense of like, these are the conditions you should start with. And that can be useful to give readers. Okay, so there's a couple consistency things that are worth considering. And one of them is formatting. If you're going to be formatting your paper, make sure it's formatted consistently throughout. If you're going to be uh, like justifying the whole document, make sure it's justified throughout. Make sure the font is the same. Make sure the text size is the same for given sections. And if you're going to use abbreviations like acetonitrile, like MECN, um, acetone, DCM versus CH2, CL2, just make sure that throughout your document that those are consistent. That can be uh, confusing for someone who's not used to it. And if you ever use abbreviations, make sure you define what those are somewhere. Now, there's some other things you can do that are nice. And so one of the things that's nice is you can include the name of a compound in a text format above the procedure for its preparation. Sometimes people include the name of a compound in the image of the structure, but that can't be like searched with control F. So it's helpful to give the name in a text format for people to easily find a molecule in an SI. Now, if you have a graph, make sure you define what the axes are. This kind of should go without saying, but you know, if you have a graph, make sure people can figure out what it is. If you're doing a purification, don't just say this was purified by chromatography on silica. Like include how much silica you use if possible, include the RFs of the compound if possible. If you did a gradient elution, make sure you report that. And the column diameter and stuff can also be reported, but the best case scenario is if you're doing something even more reproducible, uh, such as purification on a combi flash. So it could be purified on a 10 gram ready set gold with gradient elution from 5% uh, ethyl acetate hexane to 20% ethyl acetate hexane. And so just including that sort of information can be really helpful. So let's go through some examples. I'm just going to go through eight examples and uh, that'll be the end of this episode. So in this first example, we see this compound is synthesized here. They give some conditions, but there's a few issues. So one of the things that they could have included was the amount of solutions that they used to wash and do extractions. So here you can see um, the mixture was poured into saturated aqueous um, sodium bicarbonate solution and extract with ethyl acetate. They don't tell us how much of the ethyl acetate or the aqueous solution. Um, additionally, they say it was washed with distilled water and brine. They don't tell us how much and it was dried over sodium sulfate. Now, usually so the amount of sodium sulfate isn't reported as like how much they dried over. This is a really arbitrary one. And when we use sodium sulfate, we usually don't weigh it out. It's very much like just by feel. So some other things these people could have included was the conditions for chromatography. So here you can see it says the residue is purified by silica gel chromatography. No conditions at all. So that's like a, another weak point. Additionally, they don't tell us what reaction vessel is used. They just say it was dissolved in anhydrous THF. You don't know if it was a vial, a flask, or if it was some special apparatus. Additionally, they could have shown a synthetic scheme um, demonstrating what this was prepared from. Okay, so in the next example, we can see uh, this ester derivative here. They don't tell us how many grams or milliliters or milligrams they use. They say how many millimoles of stuff was used. But if you're copying this from your lab notebook, I really doubt that you wrote, I used 0.3 millimoles. You probably weighed it out. So you should include the amount of mass that you used for each of these. Otherwise, it seems like your yield is sketchy. Additionally, they don't tell us what size vessel this was used in or what type of vessel. Um, and they also could have included a synthetic scheme. Now in this third example, you can see this bromide derivative here. In this case, they don't give us the amounts of reagents and conditions. They just say it was synthesized uh, according to the conventional method, which isn't even a general procedure. So that's not great, right? They also don't give us any purification conditions. They just say white solid with a melting point. So that's annoying as well. No description of the reaction vessel and also no synthetic scheme. Now in example four, this is even worse. So no reference to preparation conditions is given. There's no general procedure, like there's just kind of nothing here. They also don't tell you how it was purified, so that's not helpful. And they don't describe the reaction vessel, and there's no scheme. So this is like one of the worst cases of a experimental. At least they give you NMR data, 
and they tell you it's a colorless oil, but that's it. Now in example five, you can see it's somewhat similar, no amounts of reagents or conditions, no purification conditions. They do give us an RF in this case. You can see an RF of 0.33 using uh, DCM methanol, nine to one, but it's not clear if that's what they did their column with. Furthermore, no description of the reaction vessel and no synthetic scheme is shown. Now here in this example, they do have a synthetic scheme, but again, no, no amounts of reagents or conditions, no purification conditions are given. It's unclear if the conditions of acetone hexanes um, was used. Um, however, they do say eluent, and so that kind of implies that they were eluding stuff with it. However, that could just be referring to the TLC plate. There's also no description of the reaction vessel. Um, and the worst case scenario here, no NMR data at all. No NMR data whatsoever. So, you know, I guess we have to just take their word for it. Now in example seven, this is a much better procedure. There's only a couple things lacking in this. They could have included a synthetic scheme. They have everything else they need here, but they could have improved the formatting a little bit because it's a little bit hard to follow. Like, where's the NMR? Where does the stuff stop? Um, so yeah. Now in this last example, we can see here, we just have the acetylation of this um, uh, cyclohexanol derivative. Now some things that could be improved is the description of the reaction vessel. Uh, the name of the chemical wasn't listed as a title here, so you couldn't control F and find your compound that you're looking for. Maybe that's just because they weren't sure what to call this. Um, but overall, that was like a pretty decent procedure. Most procedures are going to have some issues. Those were the first eight that came up in my list of um, supplemental informations. I don't think there's a great example of a perfect one. If you have a really good example of a perfect SI to follow, we can pin that in the Discord in the appropriate channel. But hopefully this has been a useful video about how to prepare a good looking supplemental information. If you like this type of video, make sure you leave a like and uh, subscribe. And I hope you have a great day.